welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. And I've got a great guest for you today. He's been on the podcast before. His name is Jeff Diverter. He's the Chief Technology Evangelist at Rackspace Technology. And I always think Technology Evangelist is the coolest job title in the world. But I've invited him on today to talk about the importance of cybersecurity, private versus public cloud, various tech trends that we're seeing across multiple industry sectors, as well as exploring topics such as where tech spending is going to rise and fall this year, the increasing risk of cyber attacks due to hybrid work environments where everybody is seems to be working on any device, any time, any location, any network, and the security responsibilities that come with that, and also the importance of cloud implementation for cybersecurity purposes across business sectors. And I also want to dive a little bit into the hiring trends in the tech industry right now, especially because there seems to be a few contradictions. We've had the great resignation, the tech skill shortage, and now the tech layoff. What does all that mean? Now, on this podcast, we've recorded more than 2,300 interviews and covered just about every security issue that you can imagine. And I recently read that given a choice of allowing your friends to spend 15 minutes in your home unsupervised or 15 minutes unsupervised on your smartphone, nearly everyone said in the report, the home. Because the thought of having someone accessing their phone was just the stuff of nightmares. You hear my opinions every single day. But today, I want to ask you, what annoys you about the lack of privacy online? And the fact that someone out there knows absolutely everything you do online, and whether you like it or not, that is your internet service provider. But if you wanted to stop your internet service provider from always looking over your shoulder and profiting from your data, well, I'm going to recommend Private Internet Access, which is the world's most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. I think it's the perfect software for staying private online because it hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection. And it's easy to use. There are many apps available for all operating systems. And most attractive of all, PIA has servers in 84 countries and in all 50 states. One subscription can protect up to 10 devices at once. And the reason I say this is my son is currently touring Southeast Asia and he told me that private internet access protects him while he's working away on numerous networks and also allows him to access his favourite TV shows at home. But I want to hear your stories too. And if you too would like to enjoy all the benefits of private internet access, now is the time to subscribe. Simply head to piavpn.com slash techtalksdaily and get an 83% discount. Seriously, 83%. That works out at just $2.03 a month because you'll get four extra months completely for free. But to activate it, you must go to piavpn.com slash techtalksdaily for a truly private digital life. One last time, piavpn.com slash techtalksdaily. Well, buckle up and hold on tight, because I'm going to beam your ears all the way to San Antonio in Texas, where Jeff's going to help me make sense of all of this and explore a few tech trends along the way. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Thank you, Neil, for having me on the show. I really do appreciate it. My name is Jeff Diverter, and I work over at Rackspace Technology, where I am inside of the office of the CTO. And my role here is, well, if you can believe it, Chief Technology Evangelist. And what that means is I get to help with the the greater CTO team to help create the, the technical strategy that marries our business strategy so that we can go off and, you know, take over the world and assist the world in their their cloud and technology endeavors. But then I also, the other side of that coin is I get to go out and tell the world about it, whether that is, you know, through podcasts like this or in video things or in interviews. And and, and interestingly, equally as much, it seems to inside our company to, to what we call our rack space employees, we call them rackers. And and getting them, you know, bought into the mission, excited about the mission, en- enhancing and telling their own stories. It's 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 a great great job to have. I can't believe they pay me to do it. 
Oh, I absolutely love that. And I can't believe it's, what, nearly two years since we last spoke. I think last time we were talking about the, the changing face of digital transformation and the world was a different place two years ago. And uh, I'm curious, what has changed since then, now the world's opened back up? And, and what's your focus at Rackspace now? You know, that's a really interesting question because you think about two years ago and we're recording this here in kind of mid-January and we yeah. had no idea what we were staring at. When we think about, well, I guess that would have been three years if I was thinking 2022. So we were in the middle of the pandemic. Sorry, my yeah. basic skills sort of failing me. But, you know, we were we were locked down. Everybody was, you know, I, I was just talking about this yesterday on 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 the live stream. I, I use the example. Everybody was just shoveling their data out into the cloud as fast as humanly possible so that their their teams could work better together. And we find ourselves now in this environment from a quote unquote digital transformation point of view where where we're we're at this crux where now all of this data is there and what a lot of companies didn't realize is there were two main things that needed to happen for for true digital transformation to be a reality and one was we had to have this ubiquity ubiquitous access to data because everything drives from the data and the second is you had to have a culture that was ready to look to a digital solution as opposed to necessarily you know hey we're going to walk over to somebody's desk and ask them a question or just keep doing something the way we've done it all the times before we can't we couldn't do that anymore so there was a catalyst and there was a capability for us to then be able to dig in and uh, and what we were we were mentioning yesterday is that we believe i believe that 2023 is truly the year that that tired old marketing term of digital transformation really can get some some meat on the bone and 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 make some businesses not only better but companies really sort of have to do it where they're going to get, you know, will they even be here in 2024? Well, here in 2023, there certainly seems to be an increase in cloud transformation projects. I'm curious, is that what you're seeing? And, and if it is, what would you attribute this to? Well, yes, I do see a lot of cloud transformation projects, but I see something even more exciting, and that is what happens before that project. You have a lot of IT leaders who are going holy cow, this is really hard. My competitors are outpacing me. I, I can easily read in the in the news and see what is going on and we're not doing it. We need to move better. We need to move faster. We need to have greater capabilities and we need to do it more efficiently. And as opposed to IT coming in, knocking on the door of, of leadership going, hey, we'd love to try this project. It'll make us much better. It has technology. Well, maybe, maybe in Q4 or whatever. Now you've got IT leaders who are inviting, or you've got business leaders who are inviting those IT leaders and IT practitioners up to the board table to have those conversations about how their business can not only you know, transform, but to truly thrive utilizing this new technology. And that, of course, leads us into cloud transformation projects. And how do you see data management strategies evolving throughout the year and beyond? And how can organizations better ensure that data is is more reliable? I appreciate it's a pretty big question, but any insights you can share around that? Well, it it you know as as I just kind of mentioned, you know as we think about the process, you've got IT leaders going, "Hey, come and help. We need IT folks. Come on up here. We we need to be better as an organization." And they come up and they say, "Here's the stuff that we could be doing and the outputs we could be getting." Great, the IT lead or the business leaders say, what do we do next? Well, it starts with the data. Nothing happens without the data. You know, when I started here at Rackspace, that was back in 2008 is when I joined joined Rackspace. And it was in and around that, that, that lovely technology of Microsoft SharePoint. But as I help companies move into Rackspace, and we're fully a, a, just a managed hosting company then, meaning we had data centers and we had smart people and we had servers and they were all for rent. You know, the, the database, the data came along as this necessary evil. It was this thing that was needed to make the, that golden application that they were moving into Rackspace run well. And that was echoed from industry to industry, region to region. But now all of that has been flipped. What we realize is the most important thing that ever existed was the data. And now it's about how do we focus on the data to get it into a state that it can be a benefit to the organization. And that includes things like, well, cataloging, what do we have? How do we get a taxonomy in place? How do we get governance in place to make sure that the right people have the right access to the right data at the right time? 
so that individuals can now start having meaningful conversations and arguments and with, with their peers around the future of the organization around a golden set grouping of data. And of course, today's computing environment involves a combination of private, public, and hybrid cloud services. It is incredibly exciting, but we do still see some of the age-old problems still coming up. And I, as we record this podcast today, I was reading that Microsoft has had to reverse a network change that went wrong because they think it was linked to tens of thousands of users worldwide being unable to access services such as Teams and Outlook, etc. So in this modern computer landscape, what do you think IT teams need to include to handle their workloads better. Well, one of the things that that they've they've realized, you know, we as we went from the let's just take it from the late teens up until now. Yeah. You know, as the cloud became a noun and ultimately in a sense a verb that organizations could action against, it, everybody sort of thought of it as this binary decision. Am I in the cloud? Am I not in the cloud? Are we a cloud first company? Are we not a cloud first company? When we say we're a cloud first company, does that mean we only use a public hyperscale cloud. I think we've matured as organizations to a point to realize that there is a place, of course, for public hyperscale clouds. And and there's a very real and big market and opportunity for that. But there absolutely still is a place for that private cl- those private cloud types of solutions. And, and there are lots of reasons we can get into what some of those are. But, but suffice it to say that for some of those applications that either you know, maybe their longevity isn't past a couple of three, four years, and it isn't worth the investment to transform them. Or, you know, maybe it's a it's running some third party application that isn't cloud native. Does it make sense to go get a bunch of EC2 and pay for that, which isn't necessarily intended to be paid and you know all day long, 365 days a year? Or or is a private cloud more economical and more manageable for them? And then there, of course, is the hybrid environment. How do these things work then together? First of all, do I how do I manage those apps that stay on prem or in a managed hoster like Rackspace or out in in a hyperscale cloud? How do we manage all of that? How do I get concise billing across all of that so I know what decisions I'm making and what the financial impact are? And then how do not just application A run in private cloud and B run in public cloud? But what happens with application C? that the environment really could be a hybrid environment where maybe data is stored in a private cloud environment and the transactional aspects or analytical aspects are running in public cloud. So IT leaders are now looking at these environments and realizing that they are in control. They don't just have to you know snow shovel everything out into a public cloud, but it's up to them to make a a thoughtful business oriented decision about where those applications run. And of course, because of the economic uncertainty on both sides of the pond and around the world, businesses are faced with doing more with less at the moment. And every new IT tech project must provide a ROI, must provide business value, et cetera. So I'm curious, where do you think tech spending is going to rise and fall this year? Mm, what a good question. So I think I can I can easily say there are two areas where it will not shrink and it will go up. And it's one that we've already talked about, and that's data, because what companies are realizing is the amount of value that exists in the data that they already have can create meaningful and significant business value, whether that is helping them run more efficiently or whether that's unlock new business opportunities that can drive new revenue. The second, and should come as no surprise, is if any company cuts spending in cybersecurity, well, it's been nice knowing you. That is one area that I think that that needs to be deeply invested in going forward. It's not one of those that we can sort of set to the side and hope for the best. Um, that the the environment is changing way too quickly. The attack surface for the bad guys is growing on a moment by moment basis, and they are ruthless. We like to go home and have dinner at night and not think as much about work and maybe go to sleep, but they don't. They stay up all night. And I think we're also seeing many contradictions in current trends around tech workers. For example, there's a lot of talk about the great resignation. And then there's also a lot of talk around the big tech skill shortage around the world. And then more recently, we're seeing big tech layoffs by the big tech companies. So I'm curious, what hiring trends do you see in the tech industry this year? Isn't it interesting, Neil, how how we went from where yeah. we now January. And all we could think about through last year, most of last year was, hey, it's the great resignation. Everybody's leaving. Everybody's flip-flopping, doing their thing. 
And and then we hit Q4 and the layoffs begin. And mm-hmm. and, and and as I look at and and other aspects in social, you know, it's not just the folks in HR or other sundry business units that are being let go. I mean, there are core technologists who are being let go. And so when I think about hiring trends, what I see is I see companies making sure that every individual is creating business value. You know, we just had the conversation around making sure that our cloud choices, our technology choices drive business value. Well, every individual needs to do that as well. And that can be hard for technologists. You know, we like to put on our blinders and, you know, not talk to humans and sit in front of an IDE and create code and and whatnot, but we need to be able to, on a moment by moment basis, a day by day basis, be able to drive and and connect the dots of our activities to driving impact to the organization. And uh, and so for individuals, I think that's super important. For what do we see in hiring trends for organizations? I see a lot of companies. It, it, it seems antithetical, but you, while there are letting people go through these big layoffs. They're also investing in those that are creating great value. You see a lot of retention efforts staying in place. It's not just that they've tightened the belt and and aren't doing these sorts of things. They have tightened the belt in letting you know folks who aren't driving that they perceive as not driving great value let them leave the company. But then those that are left, they don't want them to go anywhere. They they are they're doubling down. They are re recruiting their own employees. And of course, if we go back a few months in November and December, both of our news feeds would have been full of predictions of self-proclaimed futurists predicting what tech trends will dominate 2023. And then out of nowhere in January, ChatGPT secured all the headlines in the first month of the year. It's all anybody's talking about right now. So do you think AI has already entered the mainstream and, and, and where do you see this trend heading? So I think that AI has been technically ready for prime time and we've had it in our lives, but maybe just didn't necessarily know it. And it's just like a lot of other technologies. Even even we could we could draw the parallel to cloud. When cloud first came out, you had some core geeks who looked at it and saw the value and boom, here's a Netflix or boom, here comes a, you know, a, a other other, you know, company uh, Uber who disrupts, you know, entire industries. But you didn't see it happening across mainstream enterprises and even mid-market type companies as well, because they had a challenge. There's always a challenge when the new tech comes along of how do I connect the dots between that really cool new stuff to how I can apply it to my day-to-day to drive business value. And AI and ML has been, you know, these are terms that go back to machine learning goes back into the 50s for crying out loud. And and I've I on my podcast have talked about it for the past several years. But now here comes ChatGPT, and all of a sudden we have a use case, a use case where people can look at it and go, oh, it can write my email for me. Oh, it can write my report for me. Or even even if we're not having to do our work for us, even I'm sort of stuck here. Hey, tell me about this thing so that I can be smarter and then I can go do the work that I need to do. We now have a tangible business case to connect the dots that now I think businesses are going to look at and go, Oh, I could connect this to my chats, uh, uh, chat bots that are, you know, I've got on the website to have a more thoughtful interaction with with my employees or or fill in the blank with a hundred other things. So to answer your question, not very briefly, but to answer your question, yes, I believe the chat GPT is that golden application that unlocks AI and ML from to businesses simply because it opens their eyes to the art of the possible. Yeah, it really does feel that that penny drop moment. A few months ago, everyone was kind of like, it's too complicated. I don't understand. It's not my world. What does it ever do for me? And all of a sudden, people are now starting to thinking, well, how much more productive could me or my business be if this was in something like Office 365, if I could ask it to create an Excel formula and or even put a PowerPoint presentation on a website in several different languages? There's, there's so many opportunities there, isn't there? There is. And you know what it does is drives us right back to the first part of our conversation, because then the business also says, hey, we've got these piles of data of customer interactions. Can't we you know, point the machine learning stuff at that and now ask questions of our customers or about our customers' environments in plain text? The answer, of course, is yes. But what has to happen first? You got to get your data house in order first before you can do all that work. So now we're right back to doing data projects. And if we compare what well, January to last year, we're already seeing a huge difference and, and seeing the future beginning to evolve before our very eyes. So I, I've got to ask, what excites you about the future and especially the role that Rackspace is expected to play in that future too? 
Well, there's there's sort of two answers there. So there there's what excites me, and I'm going to also give you another you know word, not just excites but terrifies. Yeah. It goes back to to the AI and ML stuff because well, you know, we, we we've we've all played with Chat GPT at this point, and there's some really interesting add-ons to Chat GPT and some of the other AI and ML tools that are publicly available and and even in private preview right now. And there's there's some out there that you can point at your your social feed, your Twitter feed, and say, go learn how I talk. And then, and then you can paste in a, a tweet that somebody says and say, please write me an answer and it'll come back in your voice. And you think that's cool and that's clever, but how much of a stone's throw is it until it is just you online and you're just sitting back and monitoring it? And that can go to some really interesting, scary places for the futurists out there. But if we we pull that back into what excites, what gets exciting about, about all of this for, for Rackspace as we help companies, it goes back really to what we were just saying. And that is... I said this all last year the mo- to every company I talked to. I said, the most important thing that you have is your data. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it makes my applications run. No, no, there's so much gold inside of there. And, and Rackspace has this data process where we go in and help these, these companies go in and uncover what they have, create these governance plans, create taxonomies for the, for the data, create the right infrastructure housing for the data so that they can supercharge their business based on it. Whether that stuff is running in a hyperscale cloud or a private cloud, and, and that then just totally unlocks our ability to use some of those muscles, those past 23 or 24 year muscles of managing infrastructure, because infrastructure still exists, but ultimately then towards true business outcomes, whether we're writing applications from scratch, whether we're transforming them. This is really the new rack space. You know, it's not just the, the old infrastructure company of old. It's it's an organization that is solely focused on this type of transformational work that has real business value. Well, I've loved catching up with you today. The only other thing that's changed since we last spoke is I like to get to know my guests a little bit better and have a little bit of fun with them. So what I'm going to ask you now is to share with maybe your a book that has inspired you on your career or something that you're reading at the moment that we can add to an Amazon wish list or a song that we can add to our Spotify playlist that will inspire people to or just get their head in the zone. All I'm going to ask you is what are you going to leave us with and why? All right. So I'm going to leave you with both of those, actually, because I've got something for you. So from a book, I mentioned cybersecurity earlier and cybersecurity transparency moment here. I've always, you know, touted the horn that, yes, you have to you have to be secure. You have to be focused on it. But I truly didn't understand how deep that that rabbit hole really went until I read a book that was put out, at, oh gosh, about a year and a half, two years ago now. Nicole Perloth, she's a she's a, a writer over at the New York Times and studied uh, cybersecurity, you know, zero day threat threats and the marketplaces around that. And she wrote a book that came out called "This Is How They Say the World Ends." If you haven't read that book, that's a book that is easily approachable and understandable by technicians and non technicians alike. So even if you have a cursory interest in technology, go read that book. You will truly understand how how scary it is out there. I think it's a great book for anyone to read to understand cybersecurity. And then for music, I am myself a bit of a musician. And there's a band that I have followed for years. I play acoustic guitar. This is a, I call it a newer type of a bluegrass band, but they, they've they been around forever. They're called Nickel Creek, but they broke up so that they could actually be a part of many bands. But they get together every three or so years to write an album and, and tour it, but they've got a new song out and it's called Strangers. And the, the whole new album will come out, I think, in March, but but I can't recommend that enough. Awesome. I'm definitely going to be checking that song out. A friend recommended the, the book you mentioned there. This is how the, the world ends a few, I think it'd be about six months ago now. I, I too read that book, blew my mind. It certainly helps bring the whole concept to life, doesn't it? Right from the, the Snowden leaks to the... Stuxnet, Stuxnet. I mean, that was that yeah. story alone was just fascinating how that happened. I mean, wow. 100%. Oh, man. And one other thing I'm going to ask you now, you've had a fantastic career in tech and you also play a bit of acoustic guitar, but none of us are able to achieve any amount of success with a lot, without a little help along the way. So if I was to say, is there a particular person that you're grateful towards or maybe saw something in you, invested a little time and helped you get where you are today? Who would that person be? And we'll give them a shout out. You know, I've thought about that and and one name really bubbles up to the top. And when I first came to Rackspace back in 2008, I actually turned the job down by the the guy who had offered it to me. He was leading one of the main business divisions at the time. 
And then the CEO of the company took me took me to lunch, and and his name is Lanham Napier. And Lanham was the first real CEO the company had, the longest running CEO that the company had, and is truly just a super smart, but one of the nicest people who truly cares about people and is extraordinarily optimistic, even when it's hard to be optimistic when when times seem down. So Napier, a huge impact on my career. Awesome. Well, a big shout out there. And obviously, before I let you go, I also noticed you've got a podcast now. So can you tell everyone listening a little about that and the kind of topics you cover there? Absolutely. So we've been running this this podcast. It's called Cloud Talk, and you can find it anywhere you find the, the podcast. And, and I, it's, it's interview format. I talk to different technologists out in the world and, and just learn about their careers. The goal is that we under, uncover you know, different aspects of their career so that IT decision makers and technologists can can hear about, you know, these other careers and use that to help drive them in what they're doing in theirs. Now that has evolved into a weekly live stream that happens at 8.30 a.m. every Tuesday morning, LinkedIn, YouTube, these sorts of places. But but then all that audio finds its way over into the podcast as well. So the, those two things, the Cloud Talk Live and the Cloud Talk are the the, the big things that take my time these days. Well, I'll add links to that on the show notes so people can check that out nice and easily. And for Rackspace is a, a huge website. So anyone wanting just to keep up to speed with the kind of things you're working on or, or maybe even contact your team, what's the best starting point for them? Hey, one of the easiest ways to, if you find me, just go look for me on LinkedIn. I'm out there. I'm um, yeah. yeah. The info you can put in, in it. If you want to contact us over here, especially anything to do with the podcast or our, our thought leadership work, it's just solve, S-O-L-V-E at rackspace.com and that'll find it to the whole team over here. Well, we covered so much there from where tech spending is going to rise and fall this year, the increasing risk of cyber attacks, importance of cloud implementation, hiring trends in the tech industry. And you even had a chance to tell us about a great book and a song that I'm going to be checking out in a few moments. But as always, Jeff, just a huge pleasure to have you on here. Let's just not leave it two years till we speak again. Very much so. And Neil, thank you so much. It's always an honor to, to get to be on the show and visit with you. So thank you for the invitation. So a big thank you to Jeff for coming on once again and making sense of the complex world of IT. And it is more complex than ever due to the fact that every single worker has an expectation to work from any device that's closest to them in any location at any time. And most scary of all for IT people, any network. But what did you take away from today's episode? Was there anything that we missed? Was there anything that you would like to hear more of on this podcast, I always say on this podcast that it's all about you. So if you want to, if you think we're missing certain subjects and you want to hear more about that topic, please email me directly. I'll go out there and I'll find the uh, people that we need to speak with. So keep those messages coming in. I'll return again tomorrow with another guest, but a big thank you for listening today. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh, 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 oh,